Hey guys, welcome to this Train Sim TV video. This is Mark. Today we're taking a look at the Wait for Little Nightmare review again. It's episode 19 now. Now, episode 18 was actually filmed about two months ago, even though it's probably only just come out on the uh, channel. Maybe last week when this goes live, I don't know. And I've done a lot of scenery, as you can see, we're down here at Crofton East Junction, which is about three miles further than where we were in episode 18. Simple reason for that is I haven't had a convenient time where I can sit down and do some recording, and I wanted to get on to some route building. Uh, that I could just enjoy doing, so I, I did it. Uh, we'll go back to doing some scenery videos as we go along. It's all basically the same sort of thing that I was covering, to be honest. Um, episode 19, we're going to be looking at track properties and something that doesn't get covered that much. Um, speed limits and stuff like that, and other little bits like you can do track unevenness as you go over points and stuff like that. So for this, obviously, you need some track, but the thing that you do need if you're doing a prototypical route and not a fictional one, is you need a copy of your sectional appendix that Network Vale put out kindly for public consumption. Um, now, the one I've got on the screen at the minute is the one that's applicable to this route. It's an image of it that I've taken out the actual document. I'll have a document to this one in the description if I remember to put it there. Uh, and this is the London North Eastern sectional appendix. It is the 2019 one, which is applicable to when sort of here that I'm doing the route. Now obviously it does sit in the bottom left corner that says December 2006, but you can see at the top right there the date it was last updated for this route, which is the 24th of February 2018. Now I'm going to just change this to the page where we are now. This, is, this page is Croft East Junction, where we are, and you can see on the 20th, 28th of April 2019 is when this page was updated. So what does this give us? You can see various bits of information from the sectional appendix. You can't see gradients and stuff like that. You can work gradients out from it, from the mileage and change there on the left hand side, and that's a whole different ball game, and takes a lot more explaining. So what we can work out though, if you haven't got a cab video, you can work out exactly where speed limit changes are, but if you've got a cab video, you don't need to do that, you know, particularly. So, to break down what's seen on the screen at the moment, you can see where the level crossings are. You've got Crofton Old Station number one level crossing, which is what's in the screen at the moment. Uh, I was on the screen when I was on the simulator. And then you've got Street House West level crossing through your station, Red Lane level crossing, blah, 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 all the way down there. Then in the middle, you can see there's two lines. You've got the Down Ghoul and the Up Ghoul. That's what those those uh, abbreviations up there stand for. Then you can see the speed limits at the top as you're entering the area, or leaving the area in that case. And the asterisk is the point at which the line speed changes to 50 miles an hour. At mile post, 50, uh, 49 miles and zero change that's basically croft and west junction and you can see that goes to hair Park junction and if you were looking for the um the code for the route essentially is up here look we're on ln882 so if you wanted to go to hair park you'd go up a few pages i believe to find ln848 so that's all we really need to know from this to be honest in terms of the base information you can your main thing is just knowing where speed limits change now we're lucky in the sense that the wait for turn on the route is actually really simple uh, on the main bulk of it that we're doing here. So, you see that the limit is 50 miles an hour from Crofton West Junction. Now, we're already at Crofton East Junction and it carries on, as you look on the screen, at 50 miles an hour, right through to Pontefract West Junction, essentially, at uh, 50 miles an hour, then it drops to 35 and then back to 50 again at Pontefract Monk Hill. So, in terms of um, the actual route, what we're going to be doing is going into the sim, and the way that you do your speed limits is uh, pretty simple, really. All you do is when you're in your route, you go on your track tab first. It doesn't really need to do that, but I do always ensure that I'm on the right tab wherever possible. Simply press spacebar. Now, TS does have a tendency to dump if you're not careful. Um, on this sort of thing and these are various track property layers that are loading up now so the important thing to do here first before we do speed limits is actually ensure all our track is set to the correct type now yellow indicates mainline track so this all then ties into the scenario editor and the scenario editor behaves your main concern is making sure that the scenarios understand what type of track the train is going to be traveling on for instance blue track uh is that freight i believe that's freight is blue 
Oh, I'll check that. It's actually a passenger. I don't know. I can't remember which one's which. Red is free. I should have known that. Um, but basically, this track here is not set up right at the moment. It will be in a minute when I've done it, but it's not set up right at the minute. It needs to be mainline. The issue with laying it either as passenger or freight is that you end up only being able to view either passenger or freight trains down in scenario editor. If you have, if you don't have it all set as mainline or yard, your train sim will throw up ever saying this track's only saleable for freight, this track's only suitable for passenger, blah blah blah. You want to make sure that all your main lines are set to mainline and all your yard tracks are set to brown, which is yard. So we're going to go through and we're going to do all that first before we do any speed limits. So why did I lay this with passenger? And why did I lay that with freight? Why didn't I just lay it all with mainline? Because surely if I'm saying right, it all needs to be mainline, you would just lay. And I, what I'm talking about is lay with mainline selected. Now the reason you don't lay it all with mainline selected is if I have this on mainline, look how how wide that curve is. I can't go in it. That's literally as tight as I can go there. I go up here and change it to passenger. You will see when it goes in the right direction, that can lay much tighter. And then if you lay as freight, once again, you can lay a lot tighter. And then as you hard, it is the tightest setting that you can go with. Now you got to remember, you know, don't just lay it all with yard because that's the tightest you can go with. You, you need to lay with the correct sort of curvature and everything because if you're laying on a main line uh, and you want to super elevate a track, a lot of track rules, if you laid it all with freight, would then make the super elevated curves really bumpy. So if you can lay it with main line, lay it with main line. If you can lay it with passenger, uh, but you can't lay it with main line, i.e. the curve is too tight for main line, you have to lay it with passenger. Uh, then your super elevation should be okay. Certainly on the travel that I'm using, the Goo one, the JT Goo one. Now, generally speaking, don't lay like uh, curves with the freight track rule that you want to be super elevated because you'll get all sorts of bumps coming in and out of them. So yeah, as I was saying, what we need to do is make this all go yellow, basically, is, is the essential sort of thing. So simply to do that, we're going to go up here, track highlight tool, the track select tool. Click on the first track, and we want to do both lines, so just drag it across, you can see the, the arrow go onto both tracks, let go, and then just highlight, literally just go along with your mouse, I'm not holding any mouse buttons, I've just got the right mouse button clicking to move the camera around, drag it all the way you need to drag it, so we need to drag it across these junctions, now it gets very finicky sometimes around junctions, you see it's trying to go over that crossover, now we want that crossover to stay as yard type really, so that it's because uh, that's essentially what it is. It's not a freight line, it's not a loop line, and if it lies literally almost a yard line. So we've laid that to there, we've grabbed, selected that to there, and we just left click. That will cause this window to pop out on the right. Now, <clears throat> I suppose I should explain what all these boxes are. Your top right one is your track rule, and the important thing about track rules to remember is always lay your track uh, in your view with the same track rule. If you have one train here that is not going to destroy everything but the golden rule really is always lay with the same track rule because if, if you've got say three track walls along that section of track it'll just say multiple track walls found and then you can't do any of your actual settings in here because it'll bark everything essentially uh, you can change your track type so the second window down is your track type now any track within this track rule i.e the goo track rule uh, you can change it to that sort of track in there uh, for those that don't know you've got loads of track that's going to be with a high on main line in the goo track rule at the moment so there's loads of new varieties in there that came out around the same time as Midland Mainline uh, that are aimed towards the Just Train Tile Mainline. So your second one, that's your primary speed limit, your third one, sorry, your primary speed limit. So that's your passenger speed limit, let's call it. So let's say we've got a, a railway where you can see how you get the differential sign. So you get a lower speed on the top and then a, a higher speed underneath. Well, this is the opposite way around, as daft as it sounds. You, this is basically what we call it is your primary speed limit. So, I your passenger speed limit. So you should always have your highest speed limit, generally speaking, in the top box. And then your freight speed limit in the box, bottom box. We aren't doing the speed limits just yet. When we do those, we'll explain all about that. In here, this is the one we're going to be using. That's where you can change the track type. So main line, yard, passenger and freight. And then over here, you've got the track line directionality. That is on a different spacebar press. So you'll get a diff the track will change colour and all that again. And we'll go into that once again um, soon, in the, later in this video. 
That's where you can change it to be electrified, so you can change it overhead wires, third rail, fourth rail, blah, blah, blah. Well, we're not electrified, so let's leave that none. In here, you can change track sounds, but generally speaking, that doesn't often work, to be honest. Uh, and on this one, you can put special collisions on and off, and I've never really bothered to touch that. And at the bottom, you have got your super elevation button. So if your track's super elevated, you tick that. Obviously, here we're on junctions, uh, so we're not super elevated, so we leave that unticked. And then the bottom one is the track unevenness. Now we're going to go into that uh, later in this video. So that is basically your bumpiness in the track as you go over point work or rough track and stuff like that. That's what makes the cab in the simulator way not like literally making the track bumpy. That's how you do it in this window. So well, the reason we open this window is so we can make this track go yellow so it all goes mainline. At the moment you can see we've got these blue bits, that's passenger. That's right, that literally means the only type of train and scenario editor that can come down here essentially is special. Because it, it, special services can go over any track in CS, the way the dispatcher works. But we want all trains to be able to go over this, whether they've got freight, whether they've got passenger, whether they've got Tom with a ginger air in the front coach. It doesn't really matter. So we want to put it to mainline. We don't want it to be yard, we want it to be mainline. So if we click mainline, obviously it's not changed yet. When I right click off this window, it'll change. There you go. So now we've got all yellow track here. Now we're going to leave this crossover as yard, so brown equals yard, remember. But then we notice we've got a bit of mainline up here in this head shunt. Well, we don't want mainline in the head shunt. We want yard track. And this head shunt's actually overgrown and out of use anyway. This is Crofton Depot, essentially, where we are um, on the edges. This will be Crofton Depot eventually. Um, I'm hoping to get a custom asset for that. And that is the, the hope anyway. Uh, so what we're doing again is just going to select. Now, we've got multiple tracks here. Because we're not, they're not really close enough, so they won't really work. But we can drag across. When they get wider apart, it's harder to drag across. So there's only a certain distance you can go. But we can do that there. We don't have to go all the way down or anything like that. Because all we're doing is trying to change the bits that are yellow. So again, just to the middle bit. Press yard this time. It'll change it to brown. And the idea is if we're going to change multiple tracks, just try and drag it across as many as you can. Note that when you get near point work, as I said, it'll get really sort of finicky. We can see we've got all the bits highlighted there that we want. And we're going to press yard again. And then we're going to watch most of that change to brown. There you go. So again, last sort of three lines here now that I need doing in Croft and Depot. There we go. Again, just change that to yard. And there we go, Croft and Depot, apart from the head shunt, is now all yard track. Now the main one, the, the fact that this is set to mainline in the head shunt, to be honest, it does not really make a difference. It doesn't have any big effect or won't damage the route or anything like that, but you might as well do it for the sake of consistency to change it to yard. Well, I'm just going to save now. I've done a few changes to the track there, so I'm just going to save it. It has a tendency to dump when you're messing him up for his space bar and stuff like that. So let's carry on on the route now. We've got to make sure that all our track essentially is the same in terms of its track properties. So we can see we've got blue here. We don't have to highlight all the trails. So that was already yellow. So we don't need to do anything with that. We just need to change the bits that aren't yellow. And again, yellow means mainline. Means all trains can run on it. When it's blue like this, it means that freights are set in the scenario editor can't run. Obviously, you can drive a freight train on it. If you set the freight train in scenario editor to passenger... It would, it would actually work um, because of the way TS is. It just thinks the train is a passenger train. Even if you've got a coal train, if you set it as the as the driver icon to passenger, it would run. But we want it so freight trains and stuff have lower priority and can actually run on the line using the sort of priority order list. So that's why we're selecting, making sure it's all main line um, and then it'll all work properly. And that can be a common cause of why scenarios like won't root and stuff like that. That's one of your key issues. Track directionality often is another one as well. Um, and you can actually change track properties like this in scenario editor if you want as well. So if you've got a route that's not working properly, you can actually go in. You'd have to do it in every scenario, but you can actually go in there and change it if you want to. So we're coming down towards Ferris, and this is where we were in episode 17 18. Now there's a bit of stutter on this route, and I'm going to have to look into why that is. There's not particularly that many assets. There's 1,253 on this tile, but the ones we've been on, there's not that many. Uh, we're not using any funky asset blocks or VP grass or anything like that can cause to us stutter, so I'm going to have a look into see if we can slim it out a bit, because <laughs> I mean, the stutter's quite bad, but I'm getting them on other routes as well, to be fair, so I think it's probably my install 
Uh, but I do like to try and keep it um, out if I can. I mean, it's not exactly like mind-blowing scenery detail. There's housing blocks and a couple of those houses. So it should be pretty easy to sort out, hopefully. Although I do think it's probably more that my install is knackered, essentially. Uh, it's quite a few months since I uninstalled. And why, the reason I'm saying that is because if you reinstall your TS, or you knock out a load of your add-ons from TS reskins and stuff, it will make your game run smoother. Um, you can see now it'll start running smoother because I've got no scenery in. Which is uh, blindingly obvious. So you see we've got some red stuff, and that's because that's been laid with a freight rule. Uh, and that's because it's, again... Uh, on a sharp curve there. Set it to mainline. Doesn't change the curve or anything like that. It's pretty simple. Now I'm just going to go as far as Monk Hill for now because I want to try and get through all the sorts of trap properties in this video. For how many minutes have I done? We've done 15. Right, okay. So, save it again. So, that's the trap properties done. Next up we need to do speed limits and stuff. Um, dock it in my mouth. Don't ask. Um, so, we'll go back to Crofton East, because that's where we were. And then what we're going to do is we can press spacebar again. And this tab is the track directionality tab. Now, when I'm laying track, I always lay it as dual direction, you know, bi-directional. Um, and that's because it makes it so people can do scenarios if they want to run it online and stuff like that and don't have problems. Now most people that are going to be going to into stuff like that in Scenario Editor, their experienced Scenario Developers will know how to change the settings of the track. So these days I do change bits, but I do leave most of it as bi-directional. So I want all this around here to be bi-directional. Um, by bi-directional I should explain what bi-directional is. Pretty simple, it means trains can go both ways, that's what those blue arrows are signifying. Now, when we get up here, in reality, when you're on this section, obviously, it's not signalled for two directions, it's only signalled for one direction in real, in real life. So when you get to here, you don't really want it to be, you know, signalled as bi-directional. You want it to be signalled as one direction each way you track. So that your scenario editor will, you know, by default, route you down the right line. You won't have to faff about and putting extra, like, markers in and stuff like that. So the way to do this is simply... Select your track. Both tracks can be selected. And I, all I do generally is in a clear section of route. So what I call a clear section of route is this section from Pontefract here to Crofnace Junction. There's no crossovers. There's no complicated bits of track anymore. There used to be, but there isn't anymore. That's just where the coal lines were. I'm going to go through all this in a bit. Um, it's all straightforward track. There's nothing special about it. So what we can do is just set a little bit of this section to directionality controlled see there in the middle there it's set to both right now we want to set it to up and down and that means that it's set then for up and down but note and it'll do it for the entire section so it's done it for like a 500 meter section there but notice what what's happened there is if i just left that now when it's now editor i won't be able to route trains from pontifact to wakefield i.e that way at all because those arrows are pointing both pointing to the right so that's obviously saying which way trains can go in Scenario Editor. We want this inside track, the one nearest to us, we want it to point to the left, not the right. So we highlight the track. And go over here to where it says up, main, up and down. All we have to do is press toggle. Changes the direction. So now we can run trains only to the left on this track. And only to the right on the back track. Now if you're in Scenario Editor, let's say we're in Scenario Editor and a freight train has failed here. And you've got a scenario, oh, I want to send out the rescue loco from Croft and East or something like that. Then you would need to go into scenario, scenario editor and do what I've just done. And you can change it to both so you can run your trains in scenarios and stuff like that. But basically all I've done there is made it so between Pontifax and Croft and East Junction, any train in scenario editor will be forced, if it's going from east, from right to left, it'll be forced to use the inside track. And if it's going from left to right, it'll be forced to use the outside track. And that avoids us having to put in extra markers and stuff like that to try and make the train route the right direction. Simple step. And I don't need to highlight the entire route to do it. If you were really wanting to be obsessive about it, you could do. But I don't need to because there's no crossovers in between those locations. 
So we're going to press space bar again. Now this is the key one that we're looking at today. This is your speed on this tab. And I've done a little bit here because I did it for a few screenshots and stuff like that to put the signs in. But you can see by default it's set to 6040. Uh, and the colours relate to what the speed is set. That's how you know where your speed limit's changed. That's how you know what the speed limit is. Uh, ideally you, you should do. Once you learn how what, what each colour means. It's basically if it's a, a you know, a red or a whatever colour. Um, i.e. red means really slow. Green means fairly quick, 50 mile an hour. In Britain, that's quite quick, to be honest. Um, so, you can see here we've got this in the middle. We've got 6040 set in the middle of this crossover here. Which, obviously, it's not going to be 60, 60 mile an hour over that crossover. So, what we do is we go to our sectional appendix. We try to go to our sectional appendix. Now, why is this not working? This didn't work before. And I'm trying to load it up. Bear with me. Okay, I'm just going to do display capture. Always professional. So here we are. Now, again, when you see this up front for the first time, it's a bit daunting. What we're looking at here is we're looking at Croft and East Junction, as I kept saying. And we can zoom in. We can see the lines there from Oakenshaw South and Mountbatten trailing in there, 20 mile an hour. That's already set. We're looking at this crossover here, which we can see 15 mile an hour. Now, I've got my cab video also, so I can see with my cab video um, where the change should be. Now I'm going to have to go back to window capture here. I'm going to have to try to anyway. Uh, I didn't want to have to do that, but I'm going to have to do. So let's go back into TS. And uh, I need to just load my cab video up on the screen. So I can see exactly where the sign is. I can't show the cab video because it would be obviously privacy because it's a DVD that I'm watching. So I can't show that, I'm afraid. And it's a DVD from 225 Studios, which do excellent cab video footage, which is very, very useful for route building. Pretty much my go to store these days because they don't cut any bits out either, like a lot of the. Uh, companies do now there's no sign even though there's, even though this actual crossover we're looking at, I'm just looking there's no actual speed sign it's signaled from here as a reversing maneuver over the crossover but there's no actual sign for the speed indicated it doesn't stop us doing the speed limit obviously but the, you know you would expect there to be a sign now in train sim on the hood it means that people won't see the speed limit as you go over the crossover but there's no sign there in real life so that's unfortunately how it's going to have to be. Obviously, you're going to be doing a shunt from that signal forward anyway over the crossover, so it's not like you're going a long way. Essentially, what this crossover is used for is trains coming out of the depot, go to that signal to reverse to go back to our sponsor fact. It's used by a Voyager on a Sunday, I think, or something like that. There's, there's, there's odd trains that go over that way. Uh, there's more than that, obviously. So, it's really, as I said, it's really finicky. All we're doing is trying to select over the crossover. Now we're selected obviously onto the main line as well, so we're going to have to do a little fiddling here in a minute. What we want to do is set that to 15 miles an hour. On both your primary and your secondary. Because obviously they're both 15 miles an hour. Um, and all we do is right click off again. And you can see your colours change now, you've got these little checkered marks on it. And that's telling us that the speed limit is set to 15. Now what it's also done, is it's set the main line, it should be 50 mile an hour. On here, so if I right click it, if left, you know, click that bit, it's 50 mile an hour. But because I highlighted over this track, I now have to go back along this track through the junctions on both main lines and try and do it again. So we've, you know, through the main lines there. Because what we've done is we put that 15 in and it's over it some of the 50. So you have to go back in here, put 50 in both of these boxes again, right click, and you'll see. It all goes green except for the crossover that we want to be 15. So the crossover set to 15, that junction in the distance set to 20, and it's all set correctly as we want it. And that's yeah, it's as easy as that to do speed limits. Now we know that it's 50 miles an hour all the way through to Pontifact, so all we have to do for that is go along here and 
literally, you stop every so often to actually just, you know, collect your markers. Because if you go all the way to Pontifax, it won't let you drag them very easily. You've got to drag them very uh, gently. And sort of stop every so often just to just hover the mouse over the track to make it come along and join in sort of thing. And I'm just doing it as these stutters happen at the minute. So just pulling it along. We'll go all the way to Pontifat Tan Shelf with it, where the scenery ends at the minute. And it does change a bit further around there. But we're not going to do that today. We'll just set the track properties on this main bit that we've done already. So there we go, we've changed to 50 for both tracks. And you'll notice now it's going to be green all the way back. I'm just going to fly back though, I'm not going to faff about. I want to just get on with this and show you all the various different track properties. We'll go through and do bits and bobs here and there as we do future episodes. So, just wait again for it to load in. Getting it to load in now. You can see in the yard we've got the 15 limit. Now I'm just going to have a look through the sectional appendix. Now it says 15 all the way in there for this track. I suspect in the depot itself it will be 5 miles an hour. Uh, although I don't even, I don't think there's a sign to signify that. But I suspect it's 5 miles an hour. I've done they set that to 15 um, for now. But my feeling is this is 5 miles an hour. Not 15, I'm going to fly down there at 15. Um, as a result, I'm going to set it to 5 miles an hour. And all I'm doing is I'm going to drag it out onto this outer track to start with. Put 5 in both these boxes. You see that's obviously gone in as a different colour, but then... As before, I've gone over some points there, so I need to go back onto this track, highlight it, and just put the 15 back in. And then that overwrites the 5 that I put on it originally. So now I'm just going to highlight the yard tracks as, as far as I can. And this is where it gets a bit fiddly and a bit sort of tedious. Is that... We have to select every track individually almost. Uh, we've got to make sure all but all track is covered. There's no gaps. We want it all to be 5 miles an hour. You can't just literally wave a wand and make it all go to 5 miles an hour. You've got to select it like this. So I generally do it sort of from the middle. Make sure the bulk of the track gets done. And then go back and make sure I collect up any loose ends. Doesn't matter how, how sort of I go over the points and stuff at this point. I've got to make sure that like they see there... For instance, there's a bit that's been left. Got rid of that now. And again. And then what you have to do is go around testing it all as well. Where you're not sure if it's changed or not. Uh, although most of the time it should do. We've done it in this end nearly. Uh, this is only a really small yard. Imagine if you're doing like a huge yard. Such as like Ely Mills or Tinsley Yard as it was. and Stuff like that. Obviously, you can lay your track and set it to... When you're laying, you can actually set the speed when you're laying. But every time you click off and whatever, you've got to set it again. You could just do it whilst you're laying it. But I think in the net, you know, in, in the sort of like... At the end of the whole thing, I think it's... For me, personally, it's quicker to do this. And easier for me to do this. Uh, I just find it much more user-friendly. And easier to remember to do it after I've laid the track itself. I always lay the track and then do the speed limit separately. Although in this case I've done it like six months after him. In most cases I wouldn't do it that long after, obviously. So we're just selecting these two. Oh, we've moved the track instead of selecting. Just put Control and Z there to stop that. Just got to be careful that you don't end up doing that. Easy to do if you're doing a small selection as well. So you see we've left a bit by those points. I'm just going to try and make sure that, that gets covered there you can see when it goes black obviously it's telling you there's a speed limit change somewhere in there because it can't work out what the speed limit is and i'm just rushing this a little bit to make sure it gets done and then i can go on to the next part of the video because i want to get all track properties covered ideally in one video then we can go through so i have each one in a lot more detail as we go along through these videos that bit's not connected so that don't matter about that this bit Nothing's ever going to go down there because it's sort of out of use, but uh, we set it to 5 mile just in case somebody in a scenario wanted to use it. And we'll set this one to 5. 
again, it's not signposted. Now, some root developers potentially would put a sign in, even though it's not signposted. Uh, and you can try and hide them under the track, although they've got a tendency not to work when hidden under the track signs. This And the reason you do that is to make it so it appears on the hood, uh, the F4 hood in, in scenarios. And we could, we could do that. Should we give it a try? I mean, we can do. But as I said, they've got a tendency for some weird reason not to actually appear on the hood, in my experience. So what we're doing is using the JT speed signs uh, for consistency, even though when I place it under the track, it doesn't really matter. Um, and all we're doing is we pick a speed sign, we're going to place it next to the track, and then you'd, you'd expect when you're trying to place this on the right hand track, you'd, you'd expect to drag it to the right to actually select the right hand track, you know, the diverging one. I just have to drag it to the left, and then it'll select the five mile an hour line. It's sort of inverted for whatever reason, but it, that's how it works. And then you can just bury this. Whether it'll show on the hood is another matter. We don't know if it will or not. It probably will do. But I've had experience where when you bury them under the trap, for whatever reason, they do not want to appear. So, you're coming out of here. You, you don't need the 15 sign coming across this crossover because you're already doing 15 at the yard. But this crossover coming back, I think it would be useful to have it with the 15 sign underneath. Now, normally I would put an arrow, obviously, um, on top of this sign, but because I'm going to bury it under the track, you see it selected the wrong one there, it showed 50, so I have to do it again. Normally you would place an arrow on here for a diverging route, but we don't need to because it's going to be hidden underneath, so we just literally drag it down our site, nobody can see it now. Hopefully it'll appear on the F4 hood for people that are driving their free hood, uh, to show people where they're going to be turning off and stuff like that, and what speed limits are going to be. So we need to save, which I ordered did apparently. I don't know why I did it twice. So we can press space again. Now again, always save before you press space because when you press space doing the track properties, it has a real tendency to um, dump the game. I'm fully expecting it will dump at some point. Now this is one that we don't need to worry about. You got the electricity tabs and you got this one's the electricity tab. So with this one, if you were doing an electrified route, this is how you would tell if you, it was electrified or not. Obviously because this one's not electrified, it's going to all show with the lightning bolt crossed out. Because you don't want it to be electrified. Let's say this line's electrified, the main two, but the yards aren't. We want to select it as electrified, just go along like we've been doing selecting. Go over here to your lightning bolt. Instead of non, you want to either place it as over at wires, third, third, third rail or fourth rail if it's underground. And you can press over at wires. And then you can see it's gone white now. That tells you the track for scenario purposes is um, over at wires. And for also driving your electric trains on. Even though you can't see any wires over that, I could drive a class 90 on that bit of track now. And the scenario editor as well would understand that that bit's electrified. So if you do a route building, if you do a route, sorry. I'm just going to say back to non. If you do a view and you put all your wires on and stuff like that, but you don't change the track properties, even though you've got your wires on, but you don't change your track properties, you're not going to be able to run your electrified trains in Scenario Editor. If you get a thing saying track is not electrified or whatever, when you're trying to do a scenario on an electrified route, it even means that that part of the route is not electrified in real life or the track properties are set wrong, generally speaking. And that's where you do that. You can do that again in Scenario Editor. Uh, but your route should be pretty much set up already. If you're doing somebody else's route, I would imagine that it should already be set up. We don't need to worry about this. Um, we can go onto this tab. We don't need to do anything on this one at the moment. It's all, um, you know, sort of just as it is. It's, um, I believe this is a super elevation tab, although I'm not 100% certain on this one because it's not one that I generally change. That's how you would tell that your track super elevated. Now this one is your track unevenness tool. Now what is track unevenness? Track unevenness is where you can virtually make the track bouncy in cab view. So a good route that shows this is a great example is um, the Walsh Marchers line from Bossman Games. Uh, that's got like cab bounce when you're going over point work and stuff. So if you in real life know a piece of track, if it's joined to track for instance, you know it's really rough or just generally speaking, if you know track is a bit bumpy. You can go along 
and select it and make it bumpy in TS. Now, why is it all white? Well, it's all white because no track unevenness has actually been set up yet. You set it manual and it changes color. It goes brighter red the more uneven it is. So this main line here, we want it to be quite jumpy as it goes over this junction. We don't want it too extreme, especially over, over facing junctions. You want it to be a bit more than trailing junctions, but don't worry particularly about that. I will just highlight this left hand. Well, I'll highlight both shots what we're doing. Well, no, I want to highlight this one first because it, the points uh, with this crossover, it's a little bit of a short run over here. So I want to just highlight over the junction there. Because when we go over the junction in the game, we want it to go from not being that bouncy to a little bit of a bump in the cab. We want to see, want to see the cab bounce about a bit. Like if you know, obviously, you can't set it per train, but if you're going to pace it or something, it bounces about quite a bit over here. On a modern unit, you won't notice it as much, but. We want there to be some bounce there, so we're just going to set it. Uh, Gemma speak when I'm doing point work, I set it to about 35.40. You see it's gone red now. Because that's telling us that it's a little bit more bumpier. Again, we can do it over this one. Now these are trailing junctions, so obviously in this, in this way you wouldn't notice it as much as you would a uh, facing junction. Now, we don't want that little bit in the middle there to be jumpy because it's obviously just straight track. So, just over this junction, we want it to be, because it's trailing, we'll put it to 25, 30, put it to 30. So, it's not as much bump as going in the other direction. And then you can go, we've got this other crossover here. And you can go over that one, 25. Remember, just setting unevenness here. Wait, what did I just put that? Yeah, I put it in the right box. I thought I'd put it in the wrong box then. And this is a facing point, so I'll put this one to 40. And the other evenness again, it's the bottom box down there. And I'm not putting all the dots in, it puts those in. Um, it doesn't put them in automatically, you don't need to put them in. Uh, I think it does put them in automatically. If I reselect that bit, yeah, it has done. You just type in your first two numbers, unless you're real obsessive with like 40.5. Instead of just like 40 or 41 unevenness, which I can't understand why anyone would ever want that. But if you really wanted to do that, you could. Um, so we want this line, obviously, to the left to be a bit more uneven. We're going to be careful exactly where we select this because we don't want to select the main line. We're going to do it from this end instead. This is wooden jointed track, so it's obviously quite a lot more uneven. It's yard track. It's not like main line stuff. So we can set this one to 60. And it'll go much darker. So you can tell when you're flying over your you're thinking, oh, that's not right, that's a bit too uneven. What's, why is that so bumpy? That's how you can tell how bumpy it is by uh, whether you've got the red track on there or not. Now, that one, as I said, is out of use, essentially. So we're going to make that one really bumpy. Like, it's literally just broken track. And we can go in here, we can just select like we are here. Uh, put 75 in. So that'll be like bouncing all over the place in, in the cab view. Uh, and then we can go into the yard again. And set this bit to 60. And then for the yard tracks, I can set it to 30, 40, 50, whatever you want to do. I'll set it to 40. I don't want to be too extreme as you're going around the cab, uh, around the yard. Tracking there is pretty new in some places as well. Uh, and I don't actually need to cover the whole depot in this. I'll probably just do it over the points, to be honest. For the rest of the yard. It's not something that... Is, is sort of like an added feature rather than an, an essential feature. You don't need to do this by any means, and a lot of you don't bother. But I quite like to do it. Because I think it adds that bit of immersion as you're coming across a, a big junction. Especially if you know the place in real life, and you think, yeah, I noticed that when you're going over there in real life, it's quite bumpy. So a good example of that is on the met line um when i did the trap for the jt met line if you're coming up the junction after more park to what you know towards Vickensworth or towards watford you will notice that there's a right jump in the track in the game um particularly if you're going from Vickensworth towards watford at 60 mile an hour over that junction on the fasts uh, i noticed when we did the cab rides on the met for the research trips back in 2018 that that bit of track was really rough it was like properly rough bouncing all over the place so I tried to recreate that in train sim you should see hopefully as you drive the S8 or S7 plus 1 along that bit that it really is pretty uh, rough track so 
So just setting this bit up here. And we've done pretty much all of it now. Not too fussed about the end of the yard. I'm, I'm gonna just drag it across all the points. Put it to 45. So it's a little bit different. Uh, and that's covered all this area. Now, the rest of it's already set to 10. That means there's gonna be virtually no cap. So we want there to be a little bit, um, especially on the curves and stuff. So I'm just gonna go along on these curves and just set it to, um, let's see, 18. We don't want it to be too bumpy, and I'll test this obviously before I release the room. I'm not going to estimate and release. You test it obviously first. Um, you don't just like chuck it out. Quite a sharp curve, so that's 20. I'm not going to bother with the one at Featherstone because that's quite an easy curve. So that set the track on evenness. And that is essentially all the track properties tabs covered that we you know you generally sort of change those are the ones that you would mess about with the most those are the ones that you use the most and generally speaking that's how you do it if you want to you know obviously speed signs and stuff i haven't really covered that uh what are we on time wise we're on 41 minutes we're about at the end of the episode that i want to be doing here uh so i'll show an example here so i need to check the train sims dumped i, I said i said that would happen so train sims just dumped and that's what I'm saying. When you get to the end of those, pressing the um, space bar enough times, it will dump eventually. Um, so I'm going to have to load train sim back up. And then load back into the route. And unfortunately, there's not much you can see at the minute. Because I've kind of... Um, well, the game dumped. <laughs> so uh, I'll just sit and chat for a bit. Don't have much to chat about. Hope everyone's New Year's going well. We're all in lockdown if you're in the UK. Hopefully the last lockdown. And it's only been a pretty tough last 12 months. I hope everyone's coping okay. It's uh, I'm sure been hard on everybody. It's been stuck inside all the time. Hopefully, as this spring moves on, we'll be able to get out a bit more and uh, get back to some sort of normality. Thank God we've got the vaccines out there now. And they're starting to slowly circulate, so... There is a light on the in the end of the tunnel. Now, Trent Timmy's been an absolute twat. He's not letting me... I just swore, sorry, sorry team. He's not letting me capture the window. It's making me go into the route. Uh, this scenario marker is stuck down in Manchester because I haven't deleted the track yet, so you can see all that, blah, blah, blah. I know somebody's going to comment how he's waiting for some uh, hours later to Manchester going slowly at present, at best, slowly. And there's some plans I'm coming up with potentially to change how we're going to do that route or how we are going to do that route. Still happening, but there might be some changes on the way. Um, I've got my thinking cap on at the minute because at the minute it's, it's probably two years away at the rate we're going, and I don't want it to be two years away. Um, there's various options I'm looking at. Still progressing. Nearly 50% done, probably. But it's taken two years to get to that stage. It's, you know, by that, it's probably going to take 50% <laughs> you know, the same sort of time again to finish it. Uh, hence saying probably two years away. Uh, if not more, to be honest. So, you probably should expect to hear something about that in the next few weeks. I'll certainly see it making a bit of a reappearance. So what we were looking at there is obviously looking at a track and we're going to do a speed limit change. So what I can do for the sake of this video is delete this 20 mile hour limit, uh, 20 mile hour sign. So this is, you do, you've done your speed limits, you've done your track and you've put your speed limits on. But you need to signpost your route. Uh, and the reason, that there's way, various ways of doing that. The best way of doing it is track linked signs. And a track link sign is where it actually links onto the track in route editor. So let's say I'm in here in the editor and I'm like, helpfully we don't have a large sign to the right at 20 miles an hour. We have one here. So you're thinking, right, do I wanna, do I wanna place a speed sign? Or do I wanna just place, cause I can see in this, obviously quick, it's gonna be quicker just to place a 20 mile an hour right, you would think, right? But if I place that, I've just placed a sign there. That sign 
in terms of train sim's operational abilities is no difference to this ballast pile. It doesn't do anything. That sign, as you're driving in the cab, obviously, you see a 20 sign. But if you're looking at your hood, which everybody uses to drive, you don't get the 20 mile an hour notification on your hood. And the reason you don't get that notification is because this sign, there's no, no link to the track. There's no visible link. If I go up here, select speed sign, and I'm talking about JT ones here, I'm not talking about DTG and stuff like that. Obviously, the, the functions are the same, but I'm talking about the naming. So you're going to JTCL speed sign. Now I press tab, and that track is set for the right direction there, the junction. So I can just sort of press tab, and it'll point me to put the sign face in exactly the right way and everything. Now, you see it's got a zero on it at the minute. I'm going to place it over here, and I'll shuffle a bit after, but that's where I'm going to place it at the minute. Left click. Now you can see we've got this yellow line dragging about. So we want it to go on this right hand track. Again, what I said before is if you drag it over here, you'd think, all right, well, I've dragged it over here. It's going to select the right hand track. Uh -uh. TS, for whatever reason, it's inverted when you're doing junctions like this. Drag it to the left, as crazy as that might sound. And even drag it a little bit with the junction away from this uh, start point and then let go of the left click. And you got 20 sign. Now it's missing the arrow, because the JT signs, you put the arrows on yourself. And all you do is just put it at the bottom of the post, rotate it. Or you could have done the tab as I did before. And watch out for the shadow, and then you just push it up the sign. Now this can get time consuming if you're in a big yard or whatever. And DTG have better options for some of that stuff, but I'm so used to the JT stuff with work that... It just makes it a lot more simple for me to use JT stuff, and I just prefer the stuff anyway, to be beautifully honest. Um, to the DTG signs. Obviously, this syncs a sign pack out there, which is decent as well for freeware root developers, and I uh, certainly recommend that uh, for your root building signs. But I generally speaking use the JT ones because I'm just so used to them. Oh, we could do with some better ones. Uh, I think at some point and obviously uh, the Syncsys sign pack comes with a lot more varieties this JT one is pretty basic we only make signs we really need them uh, the number on it looks slightly green that's just because I've been in Root Editor when I restart the Root obviously it'll go like this one a more standard colour so yeah, I hope you've enjoyed the video guys episode 20 we'll look at some of the scenery that I've not shown you because uh, I'm aware that I've kind of gone along here and not really shown the scenery, to be honest. But thanks very much for watching, guys. Appreciate it as always. Don't forget to check out Tom on Trainsim TV. He's on Twitch. It's twitch.tv forward slash Trainsim underscore TV. Uh, various days these days. Uh, give us a like on Facebook, and that's where you're able to find out when he's going to be live and whatnot. Thanks for watching, guys. See you in a bit. Bye.